Cody Rhodes may have some trust issues with his friend Kevin Owens and perhaps others. That was the main theme on this week's edition of WWE SmackDown. Appreciate you guys watching as always. As you can tell, traveling, uh, do not have my usual setup here. So this may be a little bit more brief uh, than usual on our SmackDown reaction stuff. But it really was kind of uh, a show of two themes. And that was Cody's issues, perhaps with Kevin Owens in terms of the trust there. And also, of course, the bloodline uh, making their presence felt once again. But we'll start with Cody because it was one where he and Kevin Owens teamed up in the main event to defeat Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. Uh, and, you know, the kind of the, the show got started setting that in motion where you had Cody appearing on the Grayson Waller effect. And, of course, Waller sitting at his desk um, decided he was going to make it very clear what he thought about uh, this stuff going on with Cody defending the title against Kevin Owens brought up the fact that he thinks that uh, Cody is using Kevin Owens and Cody had to respond and say he's never done that. But you guys know, like, we're continuing to push that theme with the friend stuff, right? We've said it in, in previous months when you look at it. Like, Owens has sort of had to sacrifice himself for Cody. Randy Orton has had to sacrifice himself for Cody. And now you have kind of a, you know, a heel like Grayson Waller bringing that up and Cody's having to respond a bit to it. Um, but we know the biggest tease of the night was not that. It was during, you know, the, they get the win in the main event, and then afterwards, during the post-match, you have Cody looking at Grayson Waller and Austin Theory in the aisle, and then Kevin Owens is the person holding the championship belt, and what does he do? Just for that one split second, Owens starts to go pretty fast towards Cody Rhodes with the title in his hand. It gives you the tease that Owens is going to hit Cody with the championship, but he slows down, then he hands it to Cody, and then he just kind of makes a beeline for the ropes and then does also starts yelling at Waller in theory. So they're clearly setting you up, and the whole point is that, right, Cody saw it. It wasn't that Cody did not see this. Cody actually saw it, and then they did sort of the camera zoom uh, on Cody's face, and he has the championship. He's kind of holding it tight uh, and realizing, wait a second, did I, did I just see that? Did Kevin actually just do that? Um, and I think the way they're playing it up is like it's almost by instinct, right? That this is something that Kevin Owens has done throughout his career, which you could tell earlier in the night too during the Grayson Waller effects. You had Waller, um, you know, playing the video package of all the people that Kevin Owens has turned on, right? Sami Zayn multiple times, um, you know, talking about this stuff with Jericho and Kofi and so forth. And, and so... I think that is definitely something where you're almost like, okay, this is just Kevin Owens, right? It's just someone who instinctually is going to turn on his friends. And I think that's an interesting way to go about this, even though we're almost to the match now. But I think that the thing is, and we've, we've talked about it before. I know people have had, you know, criticism of the way this thing has played out and whether, you know, they think this has been the right move to kind of set this match up this way. But I think what we have to keep in mind here, at least my thought is that this is going to play out beyond Bash in Berlin, right? This isn't going to be something that just stops at Bash in Berlin because they have the championship match, and then we go on to the next thing. I think this is definitely leading us to that point where you're maybe going to have sort of the deception here, where it's like, you know, Cody thinking that all of his attention needs to be on Kevin Owens because now they pushed it so far to where, yeah, this is kind of who Kevin Owens has been, right? Like he has been someone who has turned on his friends in the past, and that's kind of the thing that is sort of, you know, seated in Cody's head. But what really is going to be the, the part where everybody's thinking Owens is going to eventually turn on Cody. Maybe it's in Berlin. Maybe it's afterwards. But then that's where that allows what? That allows the Viper, Randy Orton, who may be coming out of Berlin with a lot of frustration if he loses that match to Gunther. Uh, and then it's like maybe that's the person that Cody's not worrying about that he should be worrying about. And that's where kind of, you know, you eventually get to that point where we know we're going to get the Cody and Orton feud, um, you know, at some point soon. And so even though they're playing all this up with Owens, it feels a little too straightforward, right? To where, you know, they're almost making you think, okay, we're telling you that Owens is clearly going to be the guy that's going to turn. But I could certainly see a scenario where that does not happen. Um, it could, but uh, I think, you know, maybe it's sort of that, that sort of red herring to the person that Cody should really be worried about in terms of his friendship uh, and that is Randy Orton. So uh, a lot of interesting ways I think they can go with this, but I thought this was a good step in the right direction uh, to kind of play it up this way and really have that that moment after the match where Owens is sort of just like by habit, he's going to take that championship and knock out Cody Rhodes. Uh, but then he stops, hands in the title, Cody sees it, and now you have Cody 
kind of thinking, right? Uh, you have him thinking about this whole thing. And so um, that was kind of your running thread throughout uh, this edition of SmackDown. And I think it's going to be interesting, like I said, to see how they proceed uh, from here in terms of uh, not just the Owen stuff, but how does this lead us to the Orton stuff that we know is going to happen at some point. Uh, and so, yeah, I think clearly going to be a good match in Berlin. We'll talk about this match uh, next week as we make our, our bash in Berlin predictions. But uh, this adds a little bit uh, of an interesting tease to it, I think, to see what's going to happen. But like I said elsewhere, uh, you did have the bloodline as sort of the, the, the other big theme, as usual, on this show. It's the Cody and, and bloodline show, although there were a couple interesting things we'll, we'll talk about uh, beyond that. But, you know, the bloodline here where you have Solo telling everyone that the OTC is done. The original tribal chief, Roman Reigns, is not coming back. He's done. We well, you know we can't believe Solo uh, at this point when it comes to these kind of things. But, um, you know, him making that statement, but he also made another big decision, right? And that was Solo taking the tag team championship from Jacob Fatu and handing it uh, to Tonga Loa. And now you have a situation where they successfully defended the tag team titles against the Street Profits. Um, and, you know, it is kind of one of those moves where when we look back on this six months from now, you know, is uh, when we know that inevitably that the Jacob Fatu is going to probably turn on Solo at some point because that's just the way this bloodline story has worked, right? The Enforcer typically turns on the Tribal Chief, as we've seen Solo do with Roman Reigns. And if you bring The Rock into it, maybe it's Jacob Fatu who is turning uh, on Solo down the road at some point in time. But uh, that could be something where we look back on it like, wait a second, he just took my tag team championship from me. He handed it to uh, no longer I patched Tongaloa. Uh, his eye is perfectly healed now. But, you know, then we still had something else, though. Even if you want to play that into, like, the future stuff, here we also had another continued theme, as we said, of where Solo is saved by Jacob Fatu, where you had DIY come in. You know, the Bloodline's going for the attack on the Street Profits after the match. DIY comes in to try to make the save, and Solo finds himself in a situation where it looks like he's about to get super kicked, right, or whatever it was. Um, he's about to get taken out by DIY, uh, by Champa and Gargano. But then it's Jacob Fatu, yet again, saving Solo Sokoa. And that allows Solo to get the upper hand. Um, and, you know, again, that has just been the way this thing has worked. And we've said it time and time again that there is going to kind of be that that point in the story where, you know, Solo is going to realize just like he did at SummerSlam, right? We said that. Jacob Fatu was incapacitated. He had hurt himself, you know, playing up the injury and all that. And Solo did not have him there to help him. Solo's looking around. What do I do? What do I do? And then ultimately he loses the match, um, you know, to Cody. And he, Solo did make it, you know, kind of a point here too to say, hey, I am coming back for that championship. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. You know, it's probably something he has to say, but I don't think, you know, Solo's challenging for the title again anytime soon. But, you know, it, it, that is kind of the, still the theme that they're working with here is that Solo, every time he's in trouble, Jacob Fatu is there. And when he's not, what happens, right? And the big Roman Reigns return at SummerSlam. Um, Solo could not overcome Cody Rhodes. And so that is something where, you know, he is kind of his crutch. And Solo, what happens if that's ever removed, right? And they still played that up here uh, to have Jacob Fatu. Still the badass. Still the guy who just cannot be controlled. He cannot be stopped. Even if you take his tag team championship away from him. Which I think, you know, may beg the question. And you guys can weigh in in the comments. I just have not thought about this enough probably because I, I am traveling and don't have kind of have my usual research time I guess you could say but I am curious like if this was the route they were going to go um then you know why initially put the belt on Jacob Fatu I haven't thought through that one enough yet I'm sure there's a reason that if I just took a few minutes I could probably get there but um you know and then take it off of him and I know people were wondering what they're going to do like the free bird rule here right where you just have all three of those guys defended in some combination um don't know if that's going to happen I mean it seems pretty clear that it is on um, you know, Tonga Loa and, and, and Tama Tonga now. And so, um, yeah, but, but we'll see. But I think the bigger thing here is, you know, really pay attention to the fact that Solo finds himself in a precarious position once again. And it's Jacob Fatu making the save uh, to, to get him out of trouble. So, um, yeah, that was kind of your, you know, your theme here. And clearly you're going to have something else with DIY here moving forward. Probably going to have the profits involved still too, uh, just because of the beatdown after the match. But um, we know from, from a bigger perspective, we're just waiting on the return of Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman, Jimmy Uso uh, to really kickstart uh, the return of the original bloodline and all that to push us towards war games uh, at Survivor Series at the end of November. So um, back to maybe a few of those holding pattern episodes, uh, but we know perhaps something huge could happen on the SmackDown debut on the USA Network 
coming up uh, here in several weeks, even though I know you guys have probably seen it. Roman Reigns has been removed from the advertisement for that show, uh, but I don't know if I would read too much into that. I think that's because he was attacked by the bloodline. Maybe they're playing it up that way, and you know, maybe it comes as a surprise that Roman shows up, and maybe he does not show up alone, or perhaps uh, other members of his family show up, and that's how we kind of go forward to get Reigns back into the mix. But Again, like I said, those were kind of uh, two of your bigger themes on the show. Uh, the, you know, they, they were spread throughout Cody and the bloodline and all that. Elsewhere, LA Knight defeats Santos Escobar um, to retain his championship. And then perhaps the bigger thing, uh, and I want you guys to give me your thoughts on this too, you did kind of have LA Knight issue an open challenge. So, you know, if anybody wants to come out and, and sort of challenge him, you did have that. Uh, again, I've not just had a chance to put a lot of thought into that one yet, but I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, next week. He gets the win here over Escobar, and Escobar's pissed at his family. They're going to go into something with uh, Baron Corbin and Apollo Crews. But a bigger thing here, pretty good match, I thought, between these two. Went a pretty lengthy match, but we've kind of seen that with SmackDown, right? Uh, you have these these championship matches when you have them. You know, they, they want to make them feel special. I mean, what, you only had four matches on this show uh, in a two-hour show. So, um, you know, kind of one where Escobar had his opportunity, but his, his you know, family gets thrown out uh, ringside and he's left alone. And so L.A. Knight gets the win, and now we see who is next uh, to challenge him for that United States title. Speaking of titles, as I said a minute ago, uh, you are going to have that tag team championship rematch. It is going to be Alpha Fire and Isle Dawn defending against Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair. We knew we'd get there at some point, um, and now we're there. They're going to defend it in Berlin, and so uh, I would think that's where you're getting the title switch. I don't know that that's where you're getting a you know a huge turn or anything because we have talked about that, but I just I still think that one is further away uh, in terms of either having Bianca or Jay turn on each other. Uh, we're just not quite there yet. So um, I would think you're going to have a switch there, but we will save that for the Bastion Berlin uh, predictions. But, um, you know, didn't have a lot of Nia Jax, Tiffany Stratton stuff on here. You had the one backstage segment. Uh, we do know we're getting Meachin versus Nia Jax next week in the street fight for the title. Uh, so they've set that up. But, um, you know, Chelsea Green kind of continues to poke and say that uh, Nia needs to watch out because she thinks Tiffany could just cash in right after the street fight. So, um, you know, they're still playing up that dynamic, but not a lot really uh, to that this week, uh, you know, really is, is one of your main themes here on this edition uh, of SmackDown. But, I mean, that was, again, guys, kind of your, your notable stuff here. Um, as always, we, we don't necessarily uh, run through every single tiny thing, but that was kind of your your bigger stuff, of course. Um, seeing what's next with the Cody and Kevin Owens thing, and then seeing what's next as the bloodline has the control again uh, after taking out Roman Reigns. And now we just wait to see uh, when uh, the, the others are going to come back for their revenge uh, on Solo Sokoa and company. But uh, there you go. You guys let me know your thoughts on this week's edition of WWE SmackDown. As I said, sorry, I know it's a little bit uh, shorter and don't have my usual setup here, but I appreciate you guys watching as always. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button on your way out. Again, uh, thank you for helping us hit 10,000 subscribers here at Wrestling Reaction. And I uh, can't, can't thank you guys enough. It's just been awesome uh, to, to see this you know community of wrestling fans grow. And uh, it's fun to chat with you guys uh, and everything that's going on uh, right now in WWE. But again, guys, let me know your thoughts on this week's edition of WWE SmackDown.